Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you're coming from. We're going to let people kind of filter in. So I'll keep on chatting to y'all while we're waiting. If anyone wants to be generous and drop in chat where they're joining us from, that would be great. I myself am here in North Carolina in Durham. Uh, we're also joined today with Jorge Rivera, who's in Paris, France. So we'll give folks maybe two minutes to filter in. But while we're waiting again, if you're just joining us, I'd love to see where you're joining us from. If you could drop in. Oh, thanks so much. We have someone from Tanzania. That's great. Welcome. Missoula, I've been there. How's the weather in Missoula right now? we got South Carolina, cool. Kalamazoo, hey Daniel. Dana coming in from Canada. We're in Canada. And again, y'all, we'll be starting in just a minute or two. Still want to give people a couple of time to hop in. It usually takes folks a couple of minutes. We got a, a lot of folks from Ohio. I'm surprised. This is great. Okay, Toronto. Awesome. Again, for the folks just joining us, uh, I'm Corey. I'm here in Durham, North Carolina. We'll be starting in just another minute. Oh, we have from uh, Reno. Great. I have family that just moved out there. They're really, it's a really nice town. The International Sibling Society. That's awesome. Thanks for dropping that link in the chat. We got Michael from Atlanta. Great, welcome. Okay, I'm gonna give it maybe 30 more seconds and then I'll start cruising. It is great to see if you're coming from an organization, a nonprofit, uh, foundation, if you could drop that in the chat, love to see where everyone's coming and representing in addition to, to where you're joining us locally. But okay, so I'm gonna get started and we'll have people continue joining as I go. Uh, but hi, I'm Corey Halbert. I have the pleasure of introducing TechSoup and also talking a bit about how we partnered with Google and Data Commons to address some of the data challenges associated with climate change and climate action. Uh, so I'll keep this moving. Some housekeeping for starters, so that you can all engage today and that everyone can hear and participate. Uh, please keep your mic muted for the quality of the recording, um, but so that everyone is not speaking over each other, if you would like to respond live, please use the raise your hand button. Uh, we'll ask you to unmute to ask your question or comment. Uh, otherwise, please feel free to keep engaging in the chat. We'd love to see people in chat. Um, we have some folks answering questions in the chat on the TechSoup side. So feel free to keep engaging there. Uh, closed captioning is available. You can find that if you turn on the CC button located in the Zoom menu on the bottom. Before we start, I wanna give a sincere thank you to our sponsors of this event, Cloud Signature Consortium and Google.org. We're truly so appreciative of your support and really grateful for the opportunity to hold this briefing and to do this work. So today we only have a couple of speakers, uh, one being myself, Corey Halbert, hello. Uh, I'm the climate lead on the team here at TechSoup. After I speak, we'll have the chance to hear from Jorge Rivera, the data director from the One Campaign, uh, who is tuning in from Paris, France. Uh, Jorge, we're so lucky to have you speaking on this and are really excited to hear about how you've been interacting with Data Commons uh, to support the climate work that you do. So we have a relatively short time together today, uh, so I'll be keeping things moving. 
We'll start with an intro to TechSoup, lead into what is exactly Data Commons. Uh, then we'll talk about what TechSoup has been doing in terms of climate change, in terms of climate change while leveraging Data Commons. Uh, we'll then hear from Jorge about the one campaign's journey with Data Commons. Uh, and finally, we'll wrap with a short Q&A. And so as we're going, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop that in the chat. We'll keep a log of those, and then we'll respond to those at the end. First, I want to talk a bit about TechSoup and who we are. You can read our mission here. I'll read it with you. Uh, TechSoup works as a dynamic bridge that leverages technology to enable connections and innovative solutions for a more equitable planet. TechSoup does a lot to serve global nonprofits. As a provider of technology products, services, and education, we've curated the largest international database of validated NGOs. We facilitate international grant making. We amplify corporate social responsibility. And we have our own incubator for community driven tech for good, known as Caravan Studios. Through that work, We've helped over 1.4 million nonprofit organizations. We've got over 19 billion of market value out to those organizations. We estimate that the population served by the groups that we help are in excess of 5 billion. And we work in all 236 countries and territories in which the US organization is legally allowed to work. Okay, so I want to get a little more chat engagement going at the start. Uh, I want to ask you to drop in the chat, what types of data do you use? For those of us that work in the climate space, do you use spatial data? Do you use satellite imagery data? What types of data are we working with? Are you looking at maybe land use change? How about maybe freshwater health indicators? Or if you're a funder, what data do you want to see? What data comes across your desk frequently? Uh, do we have any community data folks here? How often are you working with demographic data, household data, uh, maybe human health indicators? Please feel free to drop that in the chat. Uh, I'd also love in the chat, anything that comes to mind in terms of what your data is used for. Uh, does it go out to newsletters, maybe as community education programs? Do you share it at conferences? Uh, or is it only used internally to improve your operations? Um, maybe you're producing some models of some kind, some really cool models. Uh, let's get geeky in the chat, please. Uh, I'm excited to read through it all later. Uh, thanks, John. So it looks like you're looking at census demographic. That's great, cool. So please keep on dropping things in the chat. I love to read those afterwards. Um, and I'd love to see some, some connections between folks. Maybe you're working in the same spaces you didn't know. So while y'all are doing that, and now that you know a little bit about us and we're getting to know a little bit about you, uh, I'd like to introduce Google's data commons. So Data Commons is a platform in which anyone with an internet connection can access, use, and contribute to public data. And what do I mean when I say that? There are four main elements to Data Commons. First is the Google Public Data Commons. This is the hub for a tremendous amount of public data. It's all normalized, such that these data can be related and visualized with ease. Google has added their natural language search, among other great tools, to easily navigate this library of public data. The second element is its data publishing framework. It's based on schema.org and a set of APIs. These data sets can be more easily shared, and through this shared framework, they can also be joined across other instances of data commons that I can show you an example of what that might look like in a moment. A third is the suite of tools that have been added to data commons. These include visualizations and statistical tools. There's a great mapping tool for spatial data. I know that's really important in the climate space. Uh, and again, tools to support the setting up of your own instance of data commons. Finally, it provides an open source platform, which can be developed to serve a variety of purposes and needs of the data user. Uh, as we know, in nonprofit space, there's a, there's a lot of different types of data needs. Uh, and we'll be hearing from Jorge in a moment, who will be able to speak directly to the One Campaign's experience with that, uh, which I'm really excited to hear. So the common schema is something that really excites me. And to reiterate a point, 
all these data sets together into one common knowledge graph that's pre-cleaned, pre-joined, and kept updated is a really powerful thing. So when one data set talks about a particular time or geography, it means that same thing in all the other data sets. Uh, we can think about this like we do with web pages. So there's a defined standard HTML so that web servers and browsers can communicate with one another. And by using schema.org standards to mark up our data, uh, we make it interoperable with the 50,000 plus other data sets that share that. Uh, here we can kind of look at that in action. So this is a snip that I took from my screen, my screen just this week of a query I made using the natural language search in the public data commons. Uh, I wanted to compare two variables, income and heart disease in US counties. And what data commons has done is produce the scatter plot of two variables, how some income from census.gov on the y-axis and heart disease from the CDC on the x-axis. I did not have to seek out each of these data sets individually. I did not have to format or join them. It's done that for me. And it's produced a really great visualization that I can download as a JPEG, a PNG. I can use that in my own reports, or I can download the data as a CSV, the raw data, to do more analysis on my own using my own tools. This is a tremendously powerful thing here. And the time that this has saved me, the data cleaning and formatting skills that I did not need to have to produce this is really, really great, really inspiring. So to look more closely at what data makes up data commons right now, uh, because it's vast, uh, the open source data commons server provides access for users and connections to their distributed data sets. There's both a public data commons, which is hosted by Google, and private instances of that uh, hosted by others. So TechSoup uh, has one that we could talk about later. The one campaign is working on their own. Um, there's a massive amount of data now across many different domains. There's demographics, there's economics, environmental data, health, et cetera. Um, currently, it's five times the size of the Federal Reserve of St. Louis Economic Database, which is already a huge collection of data. Um, and of course, what matters is what data do you need, right? The world of data that people need is much faster. And so what we're working on is advocating for the inclusion of more data into this data commons to fill those data gaps to serve more needs. It's always growing uh, and currently is already a massive library of data. So the key here, and again, to reiterate one of the greatest values of this tool to take away is the fact that all these data sets are normalized so that these data sets can be easily joined, reducing the need to do the data processing and formatting yourself. And for nonprofits who may not have a dedicated data staff member, uh, this can reduce the barrier to engaging with these eye-opening data sets severely. The process for searching for data, discovering data, then cleaning, then formatting, and then finally getting the chance to analyze or visualize data is no easy task, and we know this. And Data Commons addresses these needs really well. So now I want to talk specifically about climate change and the data needs that this challenge presents generally. As many of us know, climate change does not impact one industry, one community, or one discipline. No, rather, climate change is inherently interdisciplinary. It spans an entire spectrum of industry, community, and environment. Climate challenges can be highly localized, for example, in one specific river, one locality, a specific community, or it could be wide and cover an entire continent, an entire climatic system. These challenges require the data represents all the variables that are in play here, ecology, society, industry. And this data needs to have the ability to relate to each other. It needs to talk to each other and interact so that we can yield analysis that decision makers can act on. Let's consider, for example, how many disciplines may be included when addressing the climate challenges in semi-arid regions like Australia, Africa, or South Asia. These areas have shorter rainfall seasons, longer dry seasons, and they can face a myriad of variables that impact the socio, ecological, economic stability of the area. Within these regions, there are several locations known as climate hotspots, 
this is a term in which an area where climate change signals are overlapping with socioeconomic challenges, and they can compound. To address these challenges, you must consider an interdisciplinary approach. There's no other way to approach this. The economics, the social, and the political aspects are intimately coupled with the ecological and environmental status and health. Uh, I'm positive I'm missing a huge number of variables on this list that would influence the work in these regions. And if I did uh, miss any that are just screaming out loud to you and you're thinking of that, please feel free to drop any of those variables or aspects of climate work that I've likely missed in the chat. Um, but my point here is that climate challenges are not simple and data can come from a huge range of sources, uh, which the process of hunting for and normalizing again, that data can add a lot of time to an already overworked and overloaded nonprofit staff member whose priorities may have to be somewhere else. So let's again visualize how data commons can address this challenge. Um, I love this, this visualization. Here we're looking at data from Feeding America and from NASA at the same time. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Feeding America is a food security organization based in the United States uh, with an extensive network of food banks and pantries nationwide. Um, and what they've done is they've collected a great deal of food security data in the United States. What we're looking at here is the visualization of that food and security data, which is on a per capita basis on the X axis. And on the Y axis, we have maximum temperature projections based out in 2049, um, developed in a model scenario by the work of the researchers at the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. So, we can visualize these two very robust, very different data sets at once, one being food insecurity and the other being temperature projections, and ask some questions. Is there a relationship between projected maximum temperatures of these U.S. counties and food secure populations? It might be a stretch, but what this is doing is visualizing and relating two data sets from completely different sources and allowing us to develop stories and our own theories and our own hypotheses and discoveries based on that. And we can do that without the need for a data staff member to normalize and format these data sets so that they can be joined on one visualization like we see here. By being on data commons, these data are normalized already. So we can quickly and easily create graphs like this. And we can have a graph that has Feeding America data and research from the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project without having to go to either of their sites, their data download portals, format, and then visualize the data. It's already right there for us to explore. I also wanna point out off to the left in that white scroll bar, um, that's where we can navigate more variables, more variables that are ready to be mixed and matched with each other to make similar visualizations like the ones we're seeing. Uh, and again, without the need to go to the US Census or NOAA's Digital Coast or USGS, um, and download that data there. We don't have to normalize it either. If you explore data commons after this event, um, you might find that we have data sets in a great realm of uh, demographics, energy, emissions, health, housing, crime, et cetera. Um, and again, they're already there for you to explore and play with. So I wanna talk now about TechSoup's role in this and how we've been partnering with Google and data commons to continue to reduce the barrier to these data discoveries, specifically in climate NGOs. We're working to supplement the already vast network of academic and authoritative sources of environmental data, uh, like the Met Office. Again, NOAA's Digital Coast is a great tool. USGS Data Download Tool. Climate.gov is a, a tremendous resource. Um, we're not looking to replace those, rather supplement them. There's a wealth of data being collected and aggregated by small to medium-sized climate organizations, and we want to work to share and expose that great data. Like I mentioned earlier, these data discoveries can be challenging uh, due to lack of data staff, lack of resources. Sometimes we find that good environmental research is siloed. Uh, it might be collected and then put on a shelf somewhere to sit. Or as the research wraps up and is completed, there might be a newsletter or a report produced locally which could be really impactful in other communities to learn from and explore. In addition to engaging with these climate NGOs to share their data, we're also engaging with the climate community generally uh, to learn more about how their data is used. How is it being shared out? What are the tools that can facilitate more sharing of important climate data like this? Um, as our own Mike Eaton said, well, uh, data commons, this is lowering the barriers to insights. 
And I agree completely. And that's really what we're trying to do here. So there are three major elements to the work that we've been doing at TechSoup. And I'd like to briefly talk about them here. First of all, we're supporting a limited number of nonprofits to get engaged with data commons through the sharing of their data. We're really excited about this work. Uh, it helps stretch and grow the web of data that's available. I myself am managing our climate data partnerships. And so I think now is a good time for me to plug that we still have the opportunity to work with other interested organizations that want to share out their climate data through data commons. Um, so if this sounds interesting to you, if you're a data communicator in the climate space, an aggregator, a collector, please keep an eye out uh, for my email in the chat. I'm hoping someone will drop that in there soon, um, but it'll also be on the last slide at the end of this presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me. We do have a limited number of spots, but we are happy to hop on a call and talk about what this might look like. Next, we're developing a TechSoup instance of Data Commons, which of course includes all the data available through the public Google Data Commons, but we're also incorporating non-commercial data here. We're really excited as we populate this with more and more data that's highly useful for civil society. So keep an eye out for that as it develops. And finally, we're sharing out and developing a range of resources for the Data Commons community. We're hosting briefings and webinars just like this to increase visibility on what's going on in the data commons world and how many different ways it can support the work of other nonprofits and other organizations. We're building our tutorials, courses, interactive workshops to support making this tool as accessible as possible to a greater range of users and nonprofit organizations. So I would be remiss if I didn't stop talking soon and hand it off to Jorge Rivera. Uh, Jorge holds a master's degree in international affairs from Science Po Paris and is the director at the One Campaign, uh, data director at the One Campaign, pardon me. In his work, he develops and manages data pipelines, manages tools and dashboards, creates visualizations. Uh, Jorge and his team at the One Campaign have taken a really hands-on approach with data commons and in their future, their work, uh, I'm really excited to hear you speak a little bit more about that process. So Jorge, I'll hand it off to you. Please take it away. Thanks, Corey, and hi, everyone. Uh, maybe just to start a couple words about the One Campaign. Uh, and the way I would summarize what we do is that we're about getting money where it can have the greatest impact. And, and we do that by bringing clarity to complex issues, working on convincing policymakers uh, to invest money in ending poverty and preventable disease. Our primary focus is working um, on issues that affect African countries. And in, you know, in everything that we do, we use um, a lot of data that's at the core of, of who we are as an organization and what we try to do. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so today I wanted to talk to you about like, where we're coming from in our data work. Uh, what we see as the last mile data problem in terms of how, how do you get this in front of people and, and make data make a difference in, in the work that you do uh, and you know in the world uh, we take you through an example that where we launched uh, data commons which we call the climate finance files which is our effort at bringing clarity and making data on climate finance accessible and lastly tell you a little bit about what we see as the data commons era of our of our work the future of our work in many ways uh, next slide so uh, we're turning 20 uh, years old as an organization this year, and for the longest time, our data tech stack looked like a bunch of people and Excel, right? There was no problem too difficult that you couldn't just throw a bunch of analysts and many hours uh, wrangling Excel spreadsheets uh, to get an answer to that. And, and that is the situation for many organizations, right? Like, you know, it's a model that, that works to an extent. Um, it can allow you to produce good insights. It may be all that you can work with because of different challenges, right? From financing to uh, skills, talent that you're able to attract and retain and so on. Um, but at some point it, it wasn't enough for us. There, there's a, a number of issues that come with this sort of stack. If we can go to the next slide, which I summarize as a capacity. It, it does require a lot of people to be wrangling Excel spreadsheets, even if, if you're very good at it. Um, you know, if you want to do more work, work with more data, it means going, getting it from different sources, downloading it on your computer, having to do all sorts of things to, 
to get insights from it. It's not the most efficient type of workflow just because, you know, you're looking at workbooks and, and using people to do it. And to us, it also brings an issue with replicability. We're an NGO. We're not the producer of a lot of this data. So we want people to be able to trust us as a credible source. And that means showing our work and allowing people to replicate what we're saying is our results, our analysis. That's really hard to do uh, when you're just working with spreadsheets um, and, and, you know, and, and you can't kind of show the work. And so we have moved on from that sort of stack. If we go to the next slide. So something that is a lot more complex and, and we're lucky to be able to kind of incorporate uh, as many technologies and, and to have a team that can work with data in a very different way where, you know, we're, we're getting data from hundreds of different sources, websites, working with APIs. We're really focused on how do you visualize and share that data, uh, have a data platform of our own. We're really into data visualization. So the picture is very different. And that is not to say that, you know, you know, we're using data commons now and, and you'll see what that means in practice. And that is not to say that you need all of these skills and talents. That's just what we needed to develop in order to move on from the Excel framework. I don't think that that's necessarily true anymore. And I think that data commons, as we'll discuss it later on, is helping you get to a similar sort of space without having to have all the skills, talents, and, uh, you know, uh, resources to, to have a more complex um, stack. Can we go to the next slide, please? What we were trying to solve for is um, how do you make data be accessible? So, you know, having the data that you need to answer the questions that you want to answer without having to spend days or weeks compiling it, have it be understandable to the people that you're communicating it to. Um, so, you know, how do you visualize it in the right way? What context do you provide? What are the right materials and support that you bring to how you present data? And how do you make it actionable? And, and to me, the question of making it actionable, it's a lot about, are you spending most of your time getting data, cleaning data, and doing some basic number crunching? Or are you spending most of your time trying to analyze it, understand it, find ways in which it can solve a, a problem that you have, a question that you have, or, or where you can find a fact or a way to see the data that will make it hard to ignore? Um, doing that is very difficult on the kind of the, the previous model, if we go to the next slide which in our case, as an NGO that publishes reports, it, it was a lot of PDFs, you know, that, that was the extent of, of how we shared a lot of this knowledge and a lot of this data. And it's still the case in, in a lot of, you know, government reports, NGOs, you know, think tanks. A lot of that is, is reports and reports make it very easy to kind of read information and share it in an email, but they make it very hard to keep that data up to date. Um, to find exactly what you're looking for. Imagine you have a 200 page PDF and you're looking for a specific style and specific number that, that may be a challenge. Um, so, you know, we concluded that doing data through PDFs, communicating data through PDFs and research and analysis was not the right way to, to think about um, how to influence people in the end and how to get change uh, with data. So if we go to the next slide. In uh, a few years ago, we launched our, our data pl platform called data.one.org. And what you see here is an example of a report that would have been a PDF that today is a page that's breaking down the data with interactive charts. It's looking at what is the issue. In this case, we're looking at climate change in African countries. And, and then how do we make the data make sense um, and, and bring it to life in a way that is making the problem clear, pointing at the solutions, what are the opportunities what is the key data that we need to understand um, climate change in African countries, what the risks and opportunities are? So it's a very w different way of thinking about reports. It requires a different type of infrastructure, right? Here is a question of how do you keep things up to date? How do you build visualizations? Where is the data coming from? How are you gonna share it? You know, it was, it was the work of, of several years is still the main way in which we communicate data today. Um, but you know, it, it took quite a bit to, to build. And if we go to the next slide. Um, a lot of the problems that we're trying to fix are, as, as Corey mentioned in his presentation about, you know, like data coming from different places. In, in our case, if we look at the climate finance files, which is an example of how we work with data and how data commons can and is making a difference for us, 
is that this data exists in you know many different Excel spreadsheets. Basically, all developed countries report to the UN on how much they're providing in climate finance. Everyone uploads an Excel file. That Excel file has you know all sorts of messes. You know, it's it's quite messy. People don't identify countries in the same way. They don't call the same things the same. Anyway, previously doing that sort of analysis would have taken you know, and it did take us quite a few months of like wrangling this data into into a decent enough shape that can allow us to do um, research. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, now, you know, in terms of how we share it and how we're able to access and continue doing analysis through it, it can be as simple as asking a question. We've put it on data commons and it can be as simple as asking a question like how much climate change mitigation finance does the World Bank disperse? It's a very simple but complicated question. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Almost as if by magic, you know, data commons shows you uh, an, an answer to that question, right? It gives you an amount. And if, if we were able to keep scrolling there, there's a, an image, it would show you kind of different charts, different ways of looking at this question. It all happens in a couple of seconds because all the data is there because it's able to understand the kind of question that you're asking. And so that unlocks endless possibilities in terms of how you're able to analyze the data where it's not about you have your huge Excel spreadsheet and you spend a lot of time creating pivot tables and filtering and reanalyzing it. It's also not the universe where it would have taken us, you know, several days to build a few charts, uh, crunch the numbers, put them on the website. It allows us to really just ask a question and get an answer. Corey also showed you a couple of the interactions that you're able to, to have on data commons where you can build your own charts, scatter plots, maps, timelines, and so on because the data is already there and you're able to combine it with, with other sources. Can we go to the next chart, please? So we, we launched the climate finance files and you know part of our objective here was um, to, to bring more clarity and to make this data accessible and, and that it shouldn't just be about climate finance, but it's about understanding how this, this plays with other issues. So climate change, for example, is costing Africa at the moment about $15 billion per year um, that's more than the GDP of 26 countries in Africa. And by 2050, that could explode to about 50 billion per year. But before we launched this work, I mean, th there's been great effort to try to quantify this, but it it's really it's been really hard to see how much climate finance has actually been committed and delivered to these countries. And this was our effort, um, and we'll post a link uh, in the chat to bring some answers to that. Uh, we found, for example, that the 20 most climate vulnerable countries receive just 6.5% of the climate finance they need each year to adapt to climate change, which is a tiny amount. But that is only possible if you're able to bring different data sets to like look at all the data that you have and start asking some of these questions. Can we go to the next slide? So that brings me to a little bit on the data commons era for us. Um, you know, as we've discussed in this webinar, it is about bringing that barrier to access down in terms of working with data at scale. For us, the scale may be bigger than for other organizations, but ultimately it almost doesn't matter how big you are or how small you are, you face the same problems. Data doesn't come from a single source. Data needs to be clean. It needs to be normalized. All these things apply. And once you stop spending as much time on that, like you can do a lot more. Um, the question then is not about how you will get data, but what will you do with it? In which ways will you analyze it? What sort of communication support is you'll put out? So it's tipping the scales from just spending all your time compiling, cleaning, and shaping data into analyzing and amplifying that data. Uh, and that's what we have done in the last few years as an organization with the infrastructure that we had built. And that's what we hope to do with, with data commons. And if we go to the next slide, um, you know, our ambition here is, is to become the key open data repository on, on international development data, uh, development finance data as well, uh, and be the best platform where you can explore, analyze, and understand data from developing countries with our particular focus on Africa. We wouldn't be able to do that if we were just building on the infrastructure that we had been building since 2020. We're a team of four people. Yeah, you know, it's big in some ways, but it's also tiny in some ways. So if we wanted to build a database with trillions of data points, with natural language search, with access to all these different sources, like there's no way we could have done that, right? So when the opportunity to, to create a, a custom data commons instance um, came up, to us, it was a way of saying we could spend the next decade trying to figure out how to get to that point, achieve that scale. 
or we could literally just use this open source tool that is being developed by Google, make it our own, uh, build upon it, um, and you know, spend our time using the data rather than thinking where do we get it, how do we clean it, and so on. Uh, and so with that, back over to you, Corey. Thank you, Jorge. It's really great to hear you talk about this. I, I, I do love how exciting this all feels. I feel like there's a lot of momentum right now. And yeah, it's just great to hear you talk about it because it really is inspiring work that you're doing. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll turn it to the Q&A. Um, only a couple of questions. So if there's any more that uh, any more questions that anyone would like to drop in the chat, please feel free to. Um, but to start off, I'll give you a break chatting, Jorge, because you were just on and I'll answer first. So what is your ideal outcome of this work? Where do you see it going? I love this question. Um, I see this as, you know, what's your dream scenario for this? Something that, or a term that, a phrase that we've been using at TechSoup and with the Data Commons team is a flourishing ecosystem. And I, I really like that, especially in the, uh, in the climate mindset. I really like the idea of a flourishing ecosystem of data, of organizations. I see a lot of peer interaction back and forth where data discoveries are shared and, and facilitated. Um, my dream is that an organization can discover uh, some data that's across the country, across the world, uh, that impacts their own conservation work, uh, policy legislation that they're writing. Um, I, I would love to see that. Um, on the TechSoup data common side of things, I'd love to see this become a, a hub for, for civil society data, um, both representing civil society as, uh, as where they are, what civil society is in the world, um, but also providing civil society organizations and, and NGOs with data that, that would be useful for their work. So they can go as a one-stop shop, maybe like you were saying, Jorge, um, and be able to access data that influences their work. I, I wanna pin it to you now, Jorge, I know you just spoke about it, but do you have a, a dream, dream scenario with the outcome of this work? Where do you see this going? Yeah, so we're, we're very excited about, you know, what it means for us. And actually, we're spending most of this year um, reworking our data platform. So what I showed you as data, the one to be powered by data commons fully, right? So to be just leveraging all the data that is in the knowledge graph or the tools that come out of the box with, with data commons. And, and to then really make it our own, right? For it to be at the core of what we do with data. Because we think that, you know, the, the kind of efficiency gains and the simplification of our stack and how we deploy our resources, it's a massive win for us, right? To be able to just focus on delivering the insights on using the data rather than spending all of the time and effort, you know, crunching numbers in the background and cleaning spreadsheets and, and doing all of that work. So for us, the, the dream scenario is that, that yeah, we, we, as I said, we tip those scales and, and what we're spending time on is communicating, is creating data visualizations, is finding new ways for people to interact with data, thinking through how do we best leverage, uh, you know, being able to chat with your data in some ways mm -hmm. and for people to come up with their own conclusions, answer their own questions. Uh, so, you know, be a lot freer to, to use the data. So we're excited about that. And do you feel like there was an aha moment for you or your organization when you were first introduced to Data Commons that you said, okay, this is this is something that, that we should give some time to? Yeah, I think it was, you know, thinking about feeling some degree of pride of saying like, oh, we've compiled all this data. You know, we're so good. We have all these very efficient pipelines that clean it for us and that have it ready for analysis. And then being introduced to this thing that had literally trillions of data points already cleaned, already to go. And you could just like select them and use them, download them, <laughs> add them to your website. So it was like, yeah, realizing um, that all the effort was definitely worth it. It allows us to do some great work, I think, with data. But there's a whole different scale that can be achieved when when you're working as a as a sector and contributing to the same kind of standard and using the same sort of tools. And it's not just the one campaign producing its data infrastructure, but it is the one campaign contributing to a data infrastructure that is there for open data, for civil society to have access to it, 
for different data publishers to be able to contribute to the whole ecosystem as well. Truly, truly. I think, uh, you know, I, I myself am a geospatial nerd and my aha moment was definitely the mapping tools. I, I love to see, um, yeah, I, I love to see the ability to take these these really robust data sets, rigorous data, and with the click of a button, create uh, a map that in, in the climate world, that's so impactful. If you're working with communities, being able to see your street, your, your the beach that you go to, uh, your county um, on a heat map or on a plotted map. I think that's so impactful for so many different aspects of climate work, climate action work. And yeah, I, I love that opportunity to be able to play with that in a space where Otherwise, you know, we have QGIS, we have Esri tools, we have all these different geospatial tools that take some rigorous training to be able to produce a, a layout and have a PDF to put in your reports. But in this case, uh, you just click and it goes and you can download as a JPEG and just drop it into a document and, and you're cruising. It's really exciting. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's all the questions we, we've gotten so far. Please, if there's any more, uh, we're happy to field those. Uh, but I know we're wrapping up on time. So I'm gonna go now to our last couple of slides. Um, ways to stay engaged. We really love staying engaged with our communities. We wanna keep this conversation going. Um, so please reach out to us, uh, connect us with others who care about public data, who's sharing data, who works with data in a, a communicative capacity or an analysis capacity. Um, and, and, and reach out to us to export, uh, support the expansion of this work. Um, we feel that this is really important work. We're really excited about the momentum already behind this and we wanna keep the ball rolling. Um, and, and share all the projects that you know about, that you're working on in your region, not in your region, if you're connected through someone through LinkedIn or Facebook and something sounds interesting, um, please share that with us. We'd love to hear about that. Um, we have a bunch of emails that you can send that information to. We have our general data commons, a tech soup email. Um, again, uh, climate communicators, aggregators, collectors, reach out to me directly. I'd love to, to get some emails after this from some people working in really exciting spaces. Um, we also have a LinkedIn. Our data commons uh, instance of TechSoup is up. I think we dropped uh, the one campaign's instance into chat. So please check out their work. It's really exciting stuff, really great work. Um, and then finally, TechSoupGlobalNetwork.org. Um, like I said at the beginning, we do a lot of great work and supporting global NGOs. So please check out what we do. Um, that's in chat too. Thanks, Andrew, for dropping that in. And so with that, uh, we're wrapping this up. Please keep an eye out for the follow-up article and email that we'll be sending out. And we'll have a couple more resources. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, thank you again, Jorge. Um, thank you, Cloud Signature Consortium and Google.org. Uh, we really appreciate all the support. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, everyone.